I can speak now to John Herbst, former US ambassador to Ukraine and now director of the Eurasia Centre at the Atlantic Council. Good to see you this evening. Thank you very much for your time. Um, and perhaps we can just start with your thoughts. Uh, 16 days in uh, to this conflict, what is Russia's position tonight? There's talk of a, a fresh wave of attacks coming and also Belarus getting involved. OK, a look. The Russian offensive in Ukraine has gone much worse than anticipated. They have largely been bogged down around Mariupol, around Kharkiv, um, around Kiev. It is true, though, that over the past, I don't know, 24, 36, 72 hours, we've seen um, some real movement in the south and some movement uh, around around Kiev. Uh, but They've only taken, at this point, you know, almost two and a half weeks into their major invasion, one significant Ukrainian city, Kherson, in the south. Uh, even though they've actually been surrounding Mariupol since almost before this new invasion began, they still haven't taken the city. What this means is that they're starting to use the barbaric tactics that they used in Chechnya and in northern Syria, which is massive bombardment of civilian areas. You, I'd say not so much without regard for civilian lives, but to kill civilians as well as to kill soldiers, and that way to bomb their opponents into submission. This, of course, is a war crime, as is their use of thermobaric or vacuum bombs and their use of cluster bombs. When you hear President Zelensky say, as, as he has done in the last 24 hours, that Ukraine has reached a strategic turning point, he's convinced that Ukraine can win, but that surely is wishful thinking, certainly if, if, if NATO uh, doesn't do any more. Well, actually, no. I think that, in fact, Ukraine is likely to win this conflict. But the question is, how many more tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians must die before that becomes clear to the rulers in the Kremlin? Right now, you have a war of one man, Vladimir Putin, on a whole people, the Ukrainian people. It's pretty clear from watching that bizarre video when Putin announced his intention to, to move, um, and then watching his bizarre video when he announced raising nuclear alert, that even his most senior advisors are uncomfortable with this. And by launching this major invasion, Putin has greatly weakened Russia economically and geopolitically. Um, he has united Europe and, and NATO in ways he did not anticipate. Even Germany now understands that Putin is a threat to world peace. And he has brought on his head and on Russia's head sanctions which will crush the Russian economy and in the middle term and in the long term, even the Russian military. Because without, it, without a real resources, it's hard to keep your military in shape. The only real question now is, again, how much pain is he going to inflict on Ukraine before his war there is understood to be a failure? He can reduce Ukrainian cities to rubble. He can take more parts of the country. He will never, however, control more than the cities and the roads. He have, he'll face, if he actually uh, significantly reduces the Ukrainian military, he hasn't done that yet, which is also an important achievement, he will face a partisan war which will take Russian lives, Russian soldiers' lives, ad infinitum. And at some point, the Russian people will realize this is a loser of a war, and even the Russian elite, intimidated by their increasingly authoritarian leader, will understand that Putin's policies are a disaster for Russia. So, so in the long term, this is, this is the de demise of President Putin. That seems to, to be what you're saying. But in, in, in the short term, the Ukrainians are, are going to be pummeled, aren't they, in, in, in coming days and weeks. You wrote, I think, um, I, I'm right in saying that you, you were part of a, a letter to President Biden asking for more to be done. What did you mean by that? What, what exactly were you asking for? Look, the Biden team deserves credit for accurately seeing the Russian threat and laying out, I would say, a solid framework for addressing it and, and mitigating it. But in actual implementation, they've been slow and timid. Uh, I, I would say that's especially true on the military side. Uh, you know, they talked back in the spring a year ago, when you had the first Russian buildup, about providing additional arms to Ukraine. They didn't do it in the spring after the Russian drawdown. Uh, they only began to do it in connection with this crisis in late January, 
we should have been sending additional arms to Ukraine back in certainly November or December, well before this new Russian invasion began. And even after the decision to send additional arms to Ukraine, we we waited till the end of January to send our first Stinger missile to Ukraine. That's a disgrace. And now you had the disgraceful decision by the administration not to expedite the sending of MiGs from our NATO allies into Ukraine. And they did it, frankly, because they were afraid of, quote unquote, the escalatory effect. As Moscow was bombing the hell out of Ukrainian civilians, they're talking about sending warplanes to Ukraine as, quote unquote, an escalation. That is timidity parading as prudence. But, but isn't, isn't the problem that, you know, who, who, who decides uh, what, what an escalation is? We don't know what Putin's thinking uh, uh, and his behaviour has been so erratic uh, uh, and so uh, delusional in many ways. You know, he may well see that as an escalation. Well, I would hope he does see it as an indication of American intent to defeat him and not just American intent, NATO intent to help Ukraine defeat him in Ukraine. Look at the logic of your question. If we have, to, if we say, well, gee, Mr. Putin may escalate, therefore we have to hold, we have to hold our own responses. We're not only handing Ukraine to Putin; we're handing the Baltic states. The same logic would apply if Putin has his designs on the Baltic states. And why would he think that Chapter Five would save the Baltic states if he sees us cower in responding to his clearly inhumane war in Ukraine? So you're saying that we're almost being held hostage by our decision not to enforce a no-fly zone, for example. That's correct. And look, Russia today is a great danger, principally because Putin is a serial provocateur. The Soviet Union was a much greater threat to the United States, yet we were able to stand up to the Soviets going toe to toe without actually shooting over the Berlin crisis in 61, even more over the Cuban Missile Crisis in 62. There was no nuclear holocaust. What emboldens Putin is Western weakness. Western did nothing, the West did nothing after Georgia was attacked by Russia in 08. We did almost nothing after Crimea was attacked. We began to do something after the war in Donbass began in 2014, but not enough. And while we've done a great deal now, and again, you have to credit Biden with that, we have not done enough. You know, if we had sent, when Ukraine asked years ago, anti-ship missiles to Ukraine, um, Russia would not have made all that progress in the South. They would not be bombing Odessa. If we had sent anti-air missiles, not just stingers, but more powerful missiles to Ukraine, when they asked years ago, the Russian bombardment over Kharkiv, over, U over Kiev, would be far less. Our timidity has only emboldened Putin's worst tendencies. He has one great advantage, in, uh, or two great advantages, in this war. One, of course, he's a peer nuclear power of the United States, and he likes to threaten the West with that. And two, he has a KGB operative's nose for weakness. And he smells when he can intimidate his opponents. And he's smelling intimidation right now. And why do we want to feed that? I just don't know.